Okay, um, this uh, talk, it's, it's, it's going to be, um, it's not going to be a very high-powered analytic academic presentation. I'm just going to do, present some uh, studies, uh, some case examples of stuff we've been looking at around the gen general question of violence on campus and to map out some of the possible solutions that we've been thinking of um, recently. Um, and this is in the context of uh, my own work, which I've, I've been for a long time now, um, working on uh, the question of uh, reducing violence in South Africa. And only quite recently, um, at the request of a former executive dean of students, started looking at the question of violence on campus, um, which has been quite shocking to me because I don't know why, but I used to have this sort of weird La La Land idea that there wasn't really violence on campus, that, that it was a kind of collegial place where, you know, um, people were in a um, protected, in a benign social environment. And so it's been quite disturbing for me, um, even as a person who spends their, their academic life reading about the horrible things people do to each other, unpacking some of these, these, um, these issues. The first thing um, I, I, I should explain is um, the, the idea of, of, of the normal in the title. I mean, there's something of a provocation there um, in the idea of normal violence and everyday rape and common kinds of killing. I mean, these are things that, that we shouldn't think of as normal. Um, they, they, they are both... Um, unusual and also kind of morally outrageous in a way that we don't want to talk about them as being everyday. And yet, it's an important um, element of my analysis that we, that we do think of them as, as normal for a number of different reasons. Um, the first is that we seem to have a tendency towards seeing um, acts of violence as, as exceptional. And not only exceptional, but to, to, to see them as carrying some kind of um, apocalyptic weight. Um, for instance, you, you, I mean, you only have to talk to, to almost all white South Africans to, to find them speaking a certain kind of way about violence. For, and they start speaking in the way that violence isn't just a social problem, it's a kind of a barometer of a social decline or some impending social catastrophe. Um, and obviously this has got its roots in, 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 in sort of colonial racism and this idea of like civilization versus barbarism and things like that. And, and these, are, these are really not helpful ways of thinking about violence at all. Um, the other thing about uh, um, thinking about violence in this sort of exceptional way is that it produces quite strong emotional reactions um, which, which tend not to be helpful. And there, there seem to be two main emotional reactions. The one is that when incidents of violence are brought up, people just freak out. Um, and they, they, they become um, either overwhelmingly upset by them or they become enraged. Um, and you, you start seeing these emotional outbursts, which on their own would, are perhaps appropriate. But the trouble is that they, they follow a rapid cycle after which they disappear. Um, and, and no actual um, follow through is sustained. And the other reaction um, to this sort of anxiety-provoking um, way of thinking about violence is, is for people just to go into denial. They're just like, oh, no, that's not true. Um, and, I mean, it seemed to be... Um, for instance, the, 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 the former um, uh, administration under President Mbeki seemed to have this idea that, no, the best thing to do about violence is just to deny that it's happening. And, and obviously we've seen a change in that. But this kind of denialism or, or kind of a shoot the messenger attitude that anyone who refers to violence must have some sort of sinister agenda, um, none of these things actually help us solve the problem. So let's talk about then the normality of violence. Firstly, that violence in South Africa is normal in the sense that it's um, commensurate with other places with similar social and historical conditions. Um, that uh, the, the, the features that define the society having been a highly militarized totalitarian society, being an, an, a highly inequitable society, having gone through rapid social change, all of these things are known to produce societies with high levels of violence. There's nothing particularly strange about us. Um, the other thing is the university itself follows international trends in this matter. Although we're going to 
bring up some quite shocking uh, um, information about levels of violence, the interesting thing is that these fit with um, international patterns. And when we compare them to places like the United States, where the most comprehensive research has been done, um, universities are actually pretty scary places for a lot of people. There's, there, there, there are particular kinds of violence that happen a lot in universities. Um, the other thing that I, that I also want to just stop in its tracks is a, a weird and very popular belief that violence in South Africa is increasing. And, and when I tell people this, then I say, no, violence, there's little evidence to suggest that violence in South Africa is increasing. They just don't believe me. And I mean, it's my job to know these numbers. I mean, I, I sit there memorizing statistics about homicide and things like that. And, and, and those numbers are going down, actually, despite the subjective impression that, that of things spinning out of control that seems to seize people's um, imagination. Um, Having given all those warnings, um, we, we must also acknowledge that South Africa does have exceptionally high levels of violence. It does have some of the highest known levels of violence in the world. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that they're not in the forms that people usually imagine them to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run through a, 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 some, uh, they're not even case histories, they're little anecdotes. Of, of things we've looked at and, and wondered what we can learn from them. And the first um, case that I'm going to look at is, is, is an incident, in, in incident of um, a murder. And this is also the only case where I'm going to use a name. And, and I think it's important to raise the name of uh, Silabile Kuzwayo, um, one of our young students who was brutally murdered in February this year. And I, I want to raise her name because I think it's important that, that, that we remember her as an individual, as, as someone, a young person, um, coming to university with her life ahead of her, and, and all of that was destroyed through an enormous act of violence. Um, and sometime in February this year, a little email went out on GroupWise, one of those announcements that you just delete when you get them, that said a body had been found in Oval Residence and on Westville campus. Nothing more than that. No, no sense of what, how this body might have come to be there and what state it might have been. Um, and then later on, there was another message went out about, it, about an arrest. Um, and in fact, a murder suspect had been arrested. Um, and what investigators believe um, is that, um, and we must be cautious with all of these things, these are, these are legally untested allegations, okay? These are, these are simply inferences of, of investigators at the moment. Um, believe that a, a former intimate partner of hers um, had uh, entered her res room, um, assaulted her with one of these combs, um, I think you're all familiar with them. Stabbed her under the arm and under the breast, um, killing her. Um, and there's a number of, of, of interesting things about, about this. Um, firstly, we say this is an atypical situation in that we don't have a lot of murders on campus. Um, they seem to happen every two or three years or so, which is not particularly frequent. Um, but there are a number of other things that are, that are highly typical um, of this case. Firstly, that this is an act of, in, of, of intimate partner violence. This is, this is violence between people who had previously been um, involved um, in, a, in a relationship. Um, the other things that are typical about it is that there was no... Um, uh, reporting prior to, to this incident. We don't, we don't have a record of, of anything leading up to it. Although, um, if one is to speculate based on what we know from the psychological literature, this incident didn't just happen out of the blue, that there was probably a fairly long escalating preceding pattern of violence behind it. One of the interesting things about this case, which I think we should look at a lot, is that a whole lot of people heard this assault take place. Girls who were in the rooms around this res room heard the screams. Um, they pretty much knew what must be going on. Um, and they didn't do anything. Um, and, and this, I think, is something we should pause to reflect on. Why did people not react to 
the fairly sure knowledge that, that someone was in distress and danger very close to them. Um, and, and we need to look at that. We need to look at why um, the, 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 the other students who could have reacted, who could have um, um, perhaps diverted this act of violence, uh, didn't do anything. Um, and when we think about this, there's, there's a number of things that we become aware of that, um, that, that this incident is typical of. The first of them is the, the, the tolerance of intimate partner violence. Now, intimate partner violence is what we used to often call domestic violence or um, wife battering, things like that. But, but the, 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 the term intimate partner has been extended now because we realize that, that, that much of this doesn't depend on um, it actually being sort of marriage relationships or family situations. It just depends on people who have uh, been in some close emotional bond. And the interesting thing about this form, this, the, the, this, this particular form of aggression, is that it's, it seems to be tolerated by everyone. It's tolerated, um, obviously, by the perpetrators who go about doing it. But interestingly, it's also tolerated by the victims of it that um, usually when we investigate cases like this, the violence has been fairly ongoing um, and nothing has been done about it. Also, that um, when one talks to, to people who stay in res, they report that, yeah, this is normal. I mean, this is it, you know, that if, it, it, it's a normal part of living in res that you will hear someone getting beaten up by their boyfriend at certain points. Um, um, and it's not really a cause to, for any particular strong reaction. It's just one of those things that goes on. Which leads us to the, the other key issue that we learned from this, which is a problem of underreporting. And if there's one massive problem that exists with violence on campus, the, the, this is it. The, the, this is this, what has to be our starting point in thinking about the problem of violence, is, is why is there such massive underreporting, And people who work in the area of, of kind of gender violence often talk about um, the underreporting, and, and the, the numbers are, are, are kind of quite controversial. Some say 35 to one, some say 50 to one. Um, and from what we, we have seen, it seems it's even higher than that. I mean, that even less than one in 50 cases actually gets reported. Um, so we need to find a way of addressing the problem of underreporting as an essential element that sustains violence in our community. Um, looking for positives in this, um, one of the strong outcomes is that there was a very effective investigation. The investigation led to the arrest of a suspect and him being charged with um, homicide. Um, so there seems to be there, there are aspects of the system that seem to be functioning well, um, but. To say functioning well in this case is really wholly inadequate because one doesn't want to arrest murderers, one wants to prevent murder. And this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about the problem of violence, of thinking of it preventatively rather than uh, of acting after um, the disaster has happened. The second example I want to give you is, um, this is a, 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 a very widely reported case of sexual assault that happened a while ago. I mean, many of you wouldn't have even have been here at the end of 2007, and an international student who was living in um, one of the reses was um, sexually assaulted. It caused a sort of media frenzy. Many international universities wanted to withdraw their students from UKZN. Um, and it, it became a kind of a, an organizing point, briefly, with, within the university. Um, now, when we look at, 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 at that, that particular situation, what's um, atypical about it is that this was an assault by a stranger, um, which, which isn't, surprisingly, despite the way we imagine it, that isn't the way rape usually happens. Um, rapists are very seldom people who don't know their victims. Um, much more commonly, they are people who... Who, 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 who know their victims already. Secondly, what was interesting in this case is there was immediate reporting. Um, it, 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 it immediately was drawn to the attention of the university. There was immediate opening of a criminal case. Um, and so it, 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 it didn't follow the normal pattern, um, which would have been that the, the person committing the rape would have been someone who the victim knows, and the victim would have, would have um, concealed it afterwards. They wouldn't have actually 
um, reported it, and they probably wouldn't have sought any sort of help afterwards. Um, so against those atypical features of this case, what's normal about it is that it's a case of gender-based violence. And it's normal in the sense that this is over by far, by, um, by a kind of um, massive um, uh, measure, the most common kind of violence that we're dealing with on campus. Um, and we need to think about what it is. What, it, what, what is it about the whole question of gender that means that when things start going really wrong, they're tending to go wrong um, between uh, men and women, or they're tending to involve some kind of issues around masculinity. Um, so when we look at this case, um, a couple of things are, are, are worth noting. Firstly, there was a massive public outcry um, immediately in the days um, uh, after, uh, um, after th this, this matter was drawn to public attention. People were very angry, they were shouting, they were having meetings, um, and, and, and it was quite striking. There was a sense of that a, a real uh, sense of anger had been tapped within the university community. Um, at the same time, there was, a, there was an immediate very high level response from, from the university. The vice chancellor personally stepped in, uh, set up a, um, a systematic inquiry, something called the safety review was established that over a, a period of about two months um, brought in experts, interviewed people, tried to understand what had go gone wrong. Um, so. It was, it was a sort of a, a turning point. In fact, this was the point at which I was asked to become involved in the whole issue of reducing um, violence on campus, um, which I hadn't really thought about before then. But what's interesting is, is despite the, the, this dramatic outpouring of, of, of um, anger, and despite this strong university response, the whole thing sort of fizzled out. Um, that these uh, elaborate analysis was done, proposals were developed, and pretty much nothing came of them. Um, very little of what had been suggested at that point has actually subsequently been implemented. Um, and it seems we need to think about why. Um, why there's a sort of episodic reaction to these, 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 these um, dramatic incidents um, that, 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 that just doesn't sustain itself. And one of the... Um, the, the factor seems to be that there isn't really a strong enough center of accountability. There isn't a, a, a strong enough um, organizational center within the university that is mandated specifically to look at the question of safety. Not safety amongst you know, 50 other management issues, but to specifically look at, at that as, a, as both an issue regarding um, the well-being of, of the university, but as a basic human rights issue as well. Um, and it brings a, 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 um, to notice again this, this, this weird sort of short attention span people have about, about violence. Is they have a, a sort of panic reaction to it, they get angry or, or upset, and then uh, very quickly afterwards they just, they just sort of like find a way of just carrying on their, with their lives as if it never happened. Okay. Um, Another case um, that, that um, we worked with last year was interesting. Uh, no, sorry, this is not a case from last year. This is a case from 2008, quite a, you know, also an older incident, is a student. Um, if you remember in, in May 2008, South Africans went a little bit crazy and started wanting to kill all African foreigners. Um, and about 100,000 people were displaced from their homes. Uh, about 60 people were killed. Um, and there was a, there was a, a real sense of, of the, 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 the tangible reality of xenophobic violence. Um, and um, in the midst of this, um, I by accident discovered one of our students in a, in a, uh, in a safe shelter uh, in a church. Um, and she had fled from campus because she had received death threats. Um, and she took those death threats very seriously in the context that people were being killed on a daily basis um, while she was receiving them. So, and this is quite atypical. I mean, for, for, for someone to, to really believe they're about to be killed by a member of the university community because they are an African foreigner, that, that, that's not an everyday occurrence. Um, what is 
every day about it, is a pervasive underlying xenophobia in South Africa and within the university community. The other interesting thing about this case is the perpetrator of these death threats was an RMS guard. And this, shockingly enough, is highly typical, that the RMS patrol guards are, are amongst the most serious offenders on most categories of violence within the university community. Um, and this is, um, I mean, something that, 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 that we need to find a way of dealing with, because obviously the RMS guards are employed precisely to make the university safer, to protect people. Um, and, and, and not only are they, are they failing in their protective role, they actually are a um, major source of the, of, of the violent criminality that's taking place within the university. The other way in which this, this um, case is typical is that it's a form of violence linked to a, um, discrimination and inequality. It's a deliberate harassment of members of a minority, and it's linked to forms of bigotry and discrimination that are, that are viewed by many people as being socially acceptable. So, so it's a form of a violence that arises from a set of social norms um, saying, oh, it's okay to, to, to abuse uh, this particular category of person um, for whatever reason. Um, and this link between inequality and prejudice and violence, we need to examine much more closely because it seems to be one of the, the recurring patterns. Um, so we've um, identified there already the key issue is, is that what on earth was a RMS guard doing threatening to kill one of our own students? Um, and, this is ever, and, and this is part of a systemic problem that exists within the security apparatus of the university. And... Um, the other thing this points to is that there needs to be some other kind of intervention, an intervention that relates to um, uh, doing something about the abusive um, behaviors uh, that are built on, on underlying social values, um, both within the university and within society more broadly. A similar case um, that we dealt with uh, uh, was an incidence of homophobic violence which occurred last year. Um, now this was also, this, this case was also atypical in one very particular sense, that immediately after the person was assaulted, they sought help. And they approached um, the Sarah student group who, who, who provides um, support for victims of violence, um, who also brought the um, people from the Safe Campus Project into this. Um, so this, this incident was interest, interesting because of that the, 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 um, the reporting and the, and, and the immediate institutional response, um, which was initially very effective. Um, the sense in which it is normal is once again that it, 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 it was built on prejudice, that this is built on a systemic um, issue of homophobia. Um, both in South Africa and in the university, that there's, there's a sense that um, gay bashing, discrimination against gay people, hate speech against people because of their sexual orientation, and, and physical assaults, including this particular South, Africa aber South African aberration, corrective rape, that you can actually rape someone in the hope of changing their sexual orientation, that these are, these are all parts of our sort of underlying cultural norms that we've uh, we failed to address effectively. Um, so what's conventional about this is the homophobia. What's similar, again, to the case of the xenophobia is that it's, um, it's, it's a case of a violence towards minority, and it's built on bigotry and, and discrimination that are seen as, as, as kind of acceptable embedded social values. What becomes interesting about this specific case is, is how ineffective the institutional response was to it. Um, so what happened is the student reported it, partly because that student was a, had been made aware through active lobbying of, of um, uh, the support that was possibly available to them, the SERA group, the Safe Campus Project, the fact that they could, they could lay charges with RMS. Um, and all of this happened. Um, now, in a situation like this where you've got a, um, a, a, a person being targeted by someone who's in their close proximity. So what you had is a guy living in a res room, and you've got guys in the rooms around him, and they start um, uh, being abusive towards him. Um, one of the things that we know from uh, sort of all the work with um, victims of violence is at the point where they start reporting and seeking help, 
their risk level go, goes up quite dramatically. The, 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 the chances of there being worse retaliation than the original violence is, 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 is very great. And this is one of the primary considerations that, um, that, that, that has to be taken into account by um, people trying to do victim support at that point. So, very simple, what happened is um, the guy was, was offered a, a, a safe alternative accommodation in the short term. While um, the, the various support services, RMS, student counseling, Safe Campus Project, and the proctor um, then applied for the students who'd assaulted him to be removed from his res so that he could be safe in his res. The interesting thing about this case is the person responsible for making that decision refused to do that. And, and actually would, um, uh, wouldn't move the, or, or, although the, the perpetrators were, were, made no attempt to conceal themselves and were well known to a number of witnesses, the, that, that, that the, the institutional gatekeeper completely failed to implement the most basic required safety policies and put the student at enormous risk immediately after this event. Um, and this, th th this we need to think about. We need to think about the way in which there's, there's a kind of incoherence within the, the institutional organization of responses, that there seem to be elements of the system that work very well and elements of them that are, are, are really um, catastrophically dysfunctional. I don't think that's a, a sort of a um, overly purple prose to um, use. I think it, 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 it is on the level of catastrophe because essentially what we were looking at, the, that, that, that this student was at a very high risk of getting assaulted and possibly of being murdered at this point. Um, and the university's um, primary representatives just failed to, to, to respond effectively to that. Um, the other thing that, that, that starts coming out at this point is something very interesting is that one of the reasons that the, of, for that failure was because of the role of the SRC, that the SRC moved in immediately in defense of the perpetrators rather than the victim. And this is a, this is a, a standing policy um, of the SRC at, at UKZN. Um, and I tried to d discuss this with the central SRC president a, a few months ago, and he explained it to me in the sense that that the, the policy of the SRC is that no student should be excluded from the university, and, and that's a sort of non-negotiable position for them. But of course, they, they don't mean no student should be excluded from the university. They mean no student should be excluded by the university. And it's okay for students to be excluded by other students. It's okay for a student to be terrorized or assaulted by another student. It's just not okay for the university to institute proceedings against a student. Um, and the standard practice at disciplinary cases is for the SRC to always send in a representative of the perpetrators, but never to send in a representative of the victims. So they systemically um, engage in this practice of defending uh, perpetrators of violence while exposing victims of violence. And, and, and there doesn't seem to be a kind of an ethical dilemma in their minds about this. This, this, this. this seems to make sense under this notion of preventing exclusion of students. Um, and this perhaps needs to be looked at very, very carefully um, because it creates a, a situation of, of high risk for uh, many students. Okay, so, and on the subject of SRC, and one of the, the, the things that w w was happening earlier this year that, that sort of led to um, uh, us um, discussing some of these issues was, was a pattern of violence that, that occurred during the student strikes earlier in the year. Um, and what interested me about that is being a sort of long-standing human rights activist, I'm, I'm a big fan of collective action. Um, uh, I, I, I like the idea of popular resistance to forms of injustice. But what I feel uncomfortable about is, the, is, is where the use of violence is understood um, as an other necessary or acceptable part um, of those kinds of activities. Um, so what's atypical about the violence in the strikes? Okay, and we heard a number of stories both at the beginning of this year and in, in June last year, people being pepper sprayed in confined spaces, which is quite dangerous because it can lead both to uh, stampedes and some people can actually go into respiratory failure from pepper spray. People being hit with belts, people just being slapped around. Um, and 
Well, what's atypical about that is, is, is nothing. That's what happens. That almost all strikes that student strikes that ever happen at the university are violent. And there seems to be a kind of a, an overwhelming acceptance that that is just the way, that's the way things should be. And it's only when we put it in broader ethical context of why in, in, in many places there's a, there, there's a commitment when one is engaging in collective action not to become violent. Um, that this starts becoming a, um, an issue. And one of the reasons why, um, certainly, you know, in, in, in my sort of political experience, one, in, one, one doesn't engage in violence as a, as a means of contestation is because one of the things you're trying to do is to build a nonviolent society. Um, and, one of the, and when you're contesting inequality, using violence to do that pretty much ensures that the system that replaces the existing system will have new forms of embedded violence in it. Um, so what's going on in these, these strikes? Okay, firstly, there's, a, there's this underlying uh, uh, assumption that, that violence is acceptable. It's, it's not even really, when, you, when, when I've talked to the leaders involved, it's not, it's not even an assumption that violence is necessary. It's not like, oh, all other means have failed, thus we need to become violent, which was, uh, which, which was the logic of the armed struggle um, under apartheid, is that the government simply would not allow any form of negotiation. There was no choice but to become violent. Now, that's a fairly coherent position. Um, but, the, but, but in a situation where the, um, where the SRC exists precisely to peacefully negotiate disputes, uh, or, and to negotiate in student interests with, with, with the university, where they're precisely given the most senior possible forms of representation. They sit on Senate and they can speak directly to the Vice Chancellor. These, the, 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 the reason these mechanisms exist is so that they don't have to resort to violence. And yet there's no sense of that. Um, and instead, there's a sense that, that violence is wholly um, acceptable, that there's no sort of human rights issue, that the that, that idea of beating someone up just because they're not doing what you feel like them doing uh, doesn't, doesn't seem to exist. So that, the, the, the fundamental sort of core notions of human rights and democracy are just not operating in this context. Um, similarly, the notion of nonviolent negotiation just doesn't seem to be on the table. Um, and what we have instead is a, is, is, is a kind of an endorsement of violence. Um, what interests me about this, on the one hand, is, is, is the acceptability of that kind of violence. On the other hand, is the university's absolute failure to, 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 to find a way of containing it. Um, and there seems to be a number of elements to that. Firstly, this violence is predictable. We know it will happen every year and it does happen every year. And we could predict it and we could take countermeasures, but we don't as an institution. There seems to be, we wait for it to happen and then we freak out. Um, and this failure to take, um, to, 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 to in advance take countermeasures um, seems to be deeply problematic. The other thing about it is that one of the outcomes is always that nothing is done to the people who are violent. There's always the, 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 what would normally be punishments for violence offenses are negotiated away. Um, for whatever kind of reasons, that the, the, the perpetrators are, have the charges dropped against them, or even if they're convicted, um, the charges are like kept secret from the university community in order to protect their reputations and things like that. Um, and this is a very kind of weird political game that is being played. Um, but what it effectively does is, is, is it, it has a single outcome, which, which is obvious to anyone who, in psychology, is it rewards the violence. It incentivizes further violence because it says, well, it's okay to be violent because A, there'll be no bad outcome from it, there'll be no serious punishment for you, and B, you'll get your demands met really quickly that way. You won't have to bother with talking to people uh, at, in Senate meetings. You'll just, you'll just get the university to acquiesce. Um, and, and why spend a bit of time with this particular example is not because this is the worst form of violence we're dealing with, but because it forms a particular social function. Essentially, it, 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 it provides a learning model for the, for the university community, which is to say that, that violence is, is an appropriate way for solving social conflict. And not only for the university community in the sense of our young students who are going to become important members of our society, but specifically for our future political leaders. And it basically gives them a pat on the back and says, look, well, you know, when you get to senior political office, just carry on using violence whenever you aren't getting your own way as you were taught at UKZN. 
And, and I think we may live to regret um, having adopted this position. Okay, and speaking of the SRC, another incidentally uh, related case. This is a case of a, a serial offender, which, which is, quite, is, is in some senses unusual. I mean, you often have people who, 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 who um, are guilty of repeated offenses of a similar kind, but this guy just seems to just be all over the place in terms of being a, uh, an offender. Um, we initially um, flagged him as a serial sexual predator who was responsible for many reported sexual assaults. Um, simultaneously, he was started accumulating other charges of fraud, intimidation, and assault, um, disciplinary charges within the university. Um, soon after we started monitoring him, someone actually laid a criminal rape charge against him. Um, and what was interesting about this case is that this guy seemed to op operate with a kind of impunity, specifically because he had links to the SRC. And even though he was um, uh, sort of known and being monitored as an offender, the, the SRC actively protected him. They allowed him to operate out of their offices. They allowed him to pretend that he was an SRC member, even though he wasn't. Um, and, and that this continued over a period of more than two years. Um, even at the point where the executive dean of students um, placed restrictions on him, um, as saying that he may not operate out of the SRC offices and things like that. The SRC publicly refused to comply with those restrictions and, and openly defied a written order from the Executive Dean of Students um, in order to protect this person. Um, not only did they sort of uh, protect him in that way, eventually, um, despite the fact that he had multiple disciplinary hearings, despite the fact that he had a, a criminal case for rape proceeding against him, they placed him on the central SRC uh, as a you know, highest possible representative of the university, um, which, which is really quite astonishing um, because um, in other, the, 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 the sort of the, the international models and, and even other models from South Africa, one can look at the way Rhodes, for instance, handled a similar case last year. Um, individuals who are, who, are, who are known to be, um, uh, to have serious charges pending against them are, are, are generally relieved of positions of responsibility. In this case, we didn't just have serious charges against him, but, he, but, but there was strong evidence that he was a effectively a psychopathic um, recidivist offender who, who was a danger to a lot of people, um, that um, the decision was taken once again by the key institutional gatekeeper of the university just to, to allow this to proceed. And it created a situation which, which placed students in extreme danger. I mean, obviously, students would, would, um, would be inclined to trust someone who claimed to be a member of the SRC. Not only that, as a member of the SRC, you can swipe yourself in and out of student reses at will. Um, and this is a guy who, who, I mean, we'd had really multiple allegations of sexual assault um, from, from, from various students. Um, so, th so this was a, a, a very dangerous situation, and, and, and it sort of finally came to a, a head where the university actually got a, a high court interdict against him, so that now he can be arrested. But it took all of three years to, to reach that point, an accumulation of many offences, um, and a time during which we have, we have quite a few um, uh, reports of people being sexually assaulted. So when we look at these cases, what do we, what do we come to think? Um, stepping back from this, it's clear that there's one major problem, is that we imagine safety in the wrong way. Um, and, and, and this is not a university problem, this is a national problem. We imagine safety from a security slash policing perspective. So we see safety as a business of RMS. RMS are gonna keep us safe and the reason they're going to keep us safe is because of another fundamental false belief about safety, is because the people who are a risk to us are these strangers, these criminals who want to come after our stuff and are going to injure us in the process. Um, and, and this is a, f a fundamentally incorrect belief about um, f uh, risks of violence. Um, the first thing that, that we know from violence research is that people are much more at risk from people they know than from people they don't know. Um, and that when you're in the university community, your primary risk is from other members of the 
of the university community who are legitimately on campus, legitimately in res, legitimately teaching you your courses, legitimately acting as your student representative, those are the people you're most likely to be victimized by. Um, there's very little correlation between the forms of violence we see on campus and uh, our normal notion of criminality, i.e. criminal acts related to property crimes. Instead, what um, we saw in a number of the previous examples is that the violence is in, in fact linked to social norms. And this is the point which I loop back to my title about normal violence. The sense that the, 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 the forms of violence that we're seeing are ones that are tolerated or seen as being acceptable. That there's certain the ideas about categories of people, ideas about how it's okay to treat a woman or a um, African foreigner or a gay person. Um, and, 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 and arising from those norms, um, we see these socially accepted patterns of violence. Um, the other thing um, we need to look at, which, which, which really um, stands as a critique of our security perspective, is the security perspective only kicks in when people report offenses. And one of our strongest findings so far is that people don't report being victimized. There, there's, there's just um, monstrous underreporting. Um, it's at least 50 to 1 um, on most of the cases we know, particularly the worst um, kinds of violence. Um, so what are the actual risks out there? What, what, what are the dangers being posed to members of, of the university? Firstly, um, and, and this is, is, is just an enormous risk as intimate partner violence. This is simply guys being beaten up by their girlfriends. Um, Small studies we've done um, have been kind of depressing because we haven't managed to find anyone who hasn't been beaten up by their boyfriend at some point. I mean, we just can't find them. Obviously, they're there because these are very small studies. But it certainly points to the, the fact that this is a level of violence that pr affects probably between 50 and 80 percent of our female students. So what are we saying? 15,000 girls are getting beaten up. Um, and that's precisely the pattern of violence that then results in the case that we started this with, which was the homicide case. That what, what was a guy beating up his girlfriend ended up with her being dead because he happened to grab a comb that had a sharp end and stab her with it. And this is the way these forms of violence escalate typically. The other big form of violence we're seeing is sexual assault. Um, and this is a little bit less, probably, but once again, we, we, we still need to do far more comprehensive detailed studies. Probably around 30% of all the female students are getting sexually assaulted during their time at the university. Um, and almost none of them are reporting it. Um, and as soon as I say probably 30% of female students, one of the other things that we, we, we've started discovering is a level of sexual assault of male students. Um, a completely taboo topic that is very under-researched and, and not discussed at all. Um, and and, and it, 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 it forms a, the, the pattern behind this is quite strange because what we're looking at is students, male students who generally are either socially labeled as gay or perceived as being effeminate, being raped by straight male students. So these are like heterosexual males, apparently, raping guys who they think may be gay or are not sufficiently masculine. Um, and this seems to, to, to also be a significant social problem. Um, once again, it's very rare for people to report it, but we have had, we, we, we have had um, some incident, incidences brought to our attention. And, even the, and, and these are only brought to our attention confidentially. The, n n none of these victims are prepared to lay charges. Um, so the thing can never proceed to the level of security. And, of course, the other big factor we need to look at is um, the, 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 the prevalence of violence from those in authority. Um, the nature of violence is that it's easier for a person in a stronger position to be violent to a person in a weaker position. I mean, the other way around, the victim's gonna over, going to retaliate and it's going to end badly for the perpetrator. But uh, common to all institutional structures is those in power uh, have a tendency to misuse their power against those who are powerless. 
So we see a lot of um, violence uh, emerging at all levels from housecom members, SRC members, tutors, university lecturers, university um, service staff members um, against students. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a systemic pattern there of abuse of authority. And the most alarming of all of these is the systematic abuse of students by RMS guards. Um, and this takes a number of forms. Um, the most common form being sexual harassment by RMS guards, but it also escalates into um, uh, other kinds of issues. I mean, I mentioned the, this case where the RMS guard were, was threatening to kill one of the students um, because he uh, objected to her nationality. So, um, in light of this depressing picture, um, what should we do? And this is the kind of good part, because, because really there's a lot of stuff we can do, and, and, it's, and most of it's not that difficult. Um, firstly, we need to conceptually reorganize ourselves away from the reactive security model. That, that's not going to be a very helpful way of, of reducing violence. We need to keep the security services intact and effectively operational. There's no question about that. We're not talking about scrapping that. We're, saying, we're talking about adding to that a preventative model that instead of look, looking at the idea of criminality, looks at the idea of social behavior. Um, bearing in mind that most of the violent offenders are not people who think of themselves as criminals. They're not people who might you know, break into your room and steal your laptop. They're people who are just doing what is done, um, uh, abusing people's human rights in the way that, that, that they are accustomed to. Um, so step number one, and this, is, th 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 this seems to be a priority now because we're in, it seems we're in the process of changing our security service provider at the moment, um, that we need to institute a much more effective system of training RMS guards. And this, this is difficult because security guards are one of the most exploited labor groups in the country. I mean, that you don't need to have many skills to become a security guard. Um, and so they're economically exploited. They're also exploited in the sense that they're exposed to violence. Um, but the, 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 the system of privatizing security as a non-core business, and that's just allowing a kind of a generic security company to bring in people who haven't been trained to work in complex social environments at all. What they've been trained to do is kind of protect, be, to protect property, to be like night watchmen and things like that. They, they, they simply have not been given effective skilling in what you do with a, a, a large, diverse social population, how you do conflict management in those kinds of situations, or even what is considered appropriate behavior by various uh, sub-communities within that organization. This training certainly then needs to extend to student volunteers and representatives. Um, and there's a real need for people who are placed in positions of authority to have a very clear idea about what, what those responsibilities entail and, and to, to, to both get them to think through the consequences of certain kinds of abuse of authority and to inculcate a, a set of positive social values. Um, my strong feeling is that this needs to be then extended to the, the logical next step, is that there needs to be a fundamental training for everyone. Um, and this, seems, this model is gaining popularity. It's, now, it's being rolled out um, at, at Free State, at Fort Hare. Um, uh, the idea of, 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 as a fundamental requirement of entry into the university, you do a core course. Where you, are, where you are required to consider your social values and your ways of relating to other people. So that our histories of violence, sexism, of the other, other forms of discrimination can really become things that are opened up intellectually and as a matter of personal ethics. Um, and this is, I think, one of the, the powerful possibilities, partly because this is what we do. I mean, this is what we're good at. Most of us, certainly those of us who are academics in humanities and social sciences, we, we do this every day. Um, we, we, we get people to consider their values and the social consequences of, of the ways in which they live more carefully and to make more positive choices. And it seems that, that making this a, a fundamental core requisite of entry into the university community would be a highly effective way of um, reducing the violence. But, but, but it wouldn't just be that. Because 
we don't just want to reduce violence within the university. We want to, we want to, we want to really address the national problem of violence. And by doing that, we could also produce um, a new um, um, generation of uh, social leaders and participants in the society who could have more considered ways of interacting with each other and, and, and more positive ideas towards things like nonviolence, conflict resolution, and have had an opportunity to reconsider what are almost always inherited forms of discrimination and bigotry that um, actually cause people to end up um, exercising violence against others. Um, and lastly, the perhaps what is missing is, is some sort of centralized institutional authority that takes um, responsibility for this problem, that it's not farmed out to various people who already have too much on their plans. It's, it's not just dumped on, um, on RMS or on student counseling or on the dean of students, that, 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 that it actually becomes an organized center and focal point um, within the university. Um, and perhaps it's the absence of that sort of center that leads to the recurrence of these problems, leads to these sort of escalations of outrage and catastrophe, and then the kind of lapses into just like getting on with the business of everyday life until exactly the same thing happens uh, a little while later. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Um, so I'd really like it if, if people had questions and comments that they could perhaps raise and that we could think through this collectively. The, I think one of our problems might be the, the low morale of staff, which mm. leads to people being frustrated and stressed. And there was at one stage uh, the EAP unit, which the wellness unit, which was developed, which is now defunct. Mm. And maybe to try and also bring that in as one of the solutions to... Mm that people can actually go and voice their frustrations in, in an environment which is safe. Sure, sure. Um, and, and I think that's certainly important, but I think it needs to go quite a lot beyond that. And, and also, I mean, when one talks about, you know, low staff morale, one of the, you, you know, there are all these weird negative byproducts of things that are great ideas, like the idea of saying, okay, security isn't our core business, let's privatize it. Seems like a great idea. We bring in professionals, we pay them, we, 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 um, we don't get ourselves tangled up in that. What happens is you end up bringing in a security company um, who is, who's, whose staff have no investment in the university. They're gonna be rolled over every few months. They don't really care um, about the university, the well-being, well-being, the notion of the university as a community. So you start having these negative effects. Another thing that starts happening with us, you know, something like really um, a good idea like say, I'm going to eat those words. Performance management system, which is to see that people are doing their jobs properly. Okay, so what happens is you operationalize people's jobs into key performance indicators. And people who were doing a lot of really good other stuff, like people who were spending time helping students or trying to build certain kinds of support networks, but that in ways that weren't defined as the, as the actual, in terms of their job description, increasingly can't do that anymore. So this idea of this, the, this sort of extra bit of, of, of play that we have, of, of drawing on people's goodwill, um, drawing on people's basic decency, that kind of just gets gradually squeezed out of people as they're forced to just um, ratchet down their daily work into just making sure that they, that, that they achieve the numbers that they're required to. And I think these things can actually have a hugely detrimental effect on our, on our community. Um, at, at the back there. Yeah. Just to make a comment on that last um, question, the university did something responsible by setting up a Facebook uh, profile and creating an interactive forum for students to voice their opinions and concerns. But during the strike, mm. they turned a complete blind eye. The university was responsible for giving running feedback on negotiations and things like that, and it created more frustration, clearly because the university doesn't follow through. They said, we would inform you by a certain time the progress of the negotiations, and they didn't, which creates a lot of frustration. And as from the case studies, you can see that the, the university hasn't been responsible in their follow through. Mm. They set up procedures, they set up good, they, they have good ideas, and mm. it's just no follow through on it. And I think that's 
the entire presentation shows that consistency. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, the, you know, the South African problem. We have the best constitution in the world. It's, no, no one contests that. I mean, our protection of human rights is fantastic. So why then, in practice, do we have such a violent society? And, 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 and this needs to be thought through more, because when we look at the university, often the, 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 the constitution of the university, the transformation charter, all of these documents are superb. And, and there, there are directives issued that, that really should address key issues. And somehow, in the implementation, things fizzle out. Um, and it's not, um, it's not from, you know, the, the, the ideas not being good at the start. Um, and, but, and it's not a university problem, but it's perhaps exacerbated, and, and maybe this is directly relevant to you, is, is that, I mean, we're university in transition, um, and that produces a lot of conflicts. And, and for instance, the idea of a Facebook page, it fits with, the, the, the aim of that is to, is to, is not to necessarily reduce conflict on, on students, it's to manage the perception of that. I mean, we've gone from a kind of what is now an anachronistic notion of a university, where a university is a public institution for educating young people to participate in society, to, to a notion that university is a corporate brand. And the primary responsibility then of, 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 of the managers of the university is to manage the, the public perception of that brand. Um, and when you have that kind of shift, it fundamentally changes the way the, the internal problems are are being, are being addressed, because the shift is from, from a kind of a, 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 a broader perspective of, of, of addressing social values to a project, to, to, to an issue of maintaining public perception. And so I don't think one should expect that the you know, Facebook page is going to stop students spraying um, mace in each other's faces in lecture theatres. It's rather what it's going to do is try and create a, an impression of containment. Um, which, which may not actually um, be built on um, the resolution of those issues. Um, yeah, at the back there. There appears to be a, a complete failure of, 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 um, of social sanction taking place. And, and to that degree, the entire community is complicit mm. in the fact that they don't react to it, which is why we're not getting things being reported. Mm. And, and, and that complicity extends throughout the institution, but it's particularly at the, at the levels where, where people are most affected by the violence. Mm. That, 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 that peer group acceptance that mm. this is the way it happens. Yeah. That has to be addressed somehow. Yeah, I mean, you, I, think you, I think you really have cut to the heart of the issue is, um, uh, first, you know, you, you know, psychologists love to talk about parenting, and they say, you know, what's good parenting involves having consistent boundaries. That's what it's got to be about. It means like you've got to say like this is okay, that's not okay. But the important thing is you stick with it, and you maintain the same boundaries. You don't shift the goalposts, and you maintain the positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement effectively. Now, now clearly we're not doing that. But you pointed to an even deeper problem. This is not like a, a disciplinary problem. This problem goes to, to the actual individuals who are being victimized, that they are not reporting their victimization in, a, in, in an attempt to stop it as a social problem. The people who are witnessing other people's victimizations. We opened with this account of this, of, of this young girl being murdered, and the people in the surrounding res rooms heard her screams and did nothing. And, and really that is symptomatic of a very, very profound crisis that, that I think is a social crisis um, around us, is that we, 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 we just accept, like, shit happens, you know. Girl next door is getting beaten up, uh, you know. And, 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 and this is no reason to suddenly say, whoa, stop everything. Call the authorities, get someone to come and intervene. It's, that, 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 does, that is not functioning as a way of regulating social behavior. And, and once again, when we look at that, we go down to the core issue, is that we've internalized, as, as a social norm, the acceptability of certain patterns of violence, particularly patterns of violence linked to beliefs about um, inequality, that it's okay for certain categories of people to infringe the human rights of other categories of people. Mm. Um, yeah, 
Um, I, I just wanted to um, also say something in, in relation to the idea of social sanction of the of the university community, which uh, certainly we have a responsibility to like band together and 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 uh, and discuss things and object to things. But to a certain extent, I still think it's the it is the responsibility of the university to foster such an environment where people don't feel like they might bring themselves uh, into uh, well, under threat in any way if they are to speak out about certain things. I, I have a, a case that relates to some of the things that, um, that have been discussed where I'm, I happen to be a, a previous SRC member for a minority organization that was specifically uh, um, trying to tackle some issues of violence on campus. And uh, a situation happened where uh, uh, a student had been attacked and the SRC my SRC that I was on that, that very year um, came to the defense of the perpetrator and, uh, I, and myself had an objection to that defense of the perpetrator and came to the defense of the victim in that situation and found myself with uh, charges of racism and various other sorts of bits and pieces being laid against me, being sort of abused and uh, accused by members of the staff of the university as being overzealous uh, such things where, to the point where it actually becomes impossible uh, even like within the community of the university to actually to, to, to speak up and to, to, to be part of something like not sanctioning this kind of behavior. So I, I still think that it's, it's, it, it's important for us to do it together and it's important for us to be responsible as individual citizens but I still think it's up to the university to create a space where that's viable. Yeah, and there's, there, there's certainly a, 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 a clear multiple breakdown, and, 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 and the most striking areas of that breakdown are the RMS patrol guards, not the investigators, they're great. The RMS patrol guards have, are, are absolutely failing as a protective resource. The SRC are, are actively um, protecting uh, perpetrators against students. And also this, the other thing is there seems to be a kind of a erratic ambivalence in the disciplinary process, that people can sort of get almost any unpredictable slap on the wrist for a very serious offense or something else, that, that there isn't a consistency in, in the university's um, implementation of, 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 of the safety nets. Um, just more of a comment, that training the solution for all students to do as they enter the university, I feel that that could be a really good thing and I think bystander apathy needs to be um, addressed in that um, course, you can call it that. And I think that also people, bystanders don't do anything because it's related again to the underreporting because people feel, again, nothing's going to happen and which leads right back to management at the top level. And so I just feel like how that's a very, very core thing that has to be dealt with because people are not going to report something if they know they're just going to be more open to more violence and at more risk. Mm. And, and that, that's one of the, the, the most horrifying things that has come out of this work is not of the incidents happening, but where they've happened and students have actually been in more risk because they've mis mistakenly trusted the university for, to protect them. And that is really just, that's so wildly, profoundly unacceptable that that should be one of our priorities. Perhaps I can just throw a question out to, this, to the students, just to, to bounce this. If there was a rule requiring any person who suspected that a violent act was taking place to report it, would that be helpful? That if you heard someone in the room next door screaming, and you failed to report it, and that person ended up getting injured, you would be charged with a disciplinary offense, for instance. Or would that, would, would that have catastrophic negative side effects as well? And yet, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not always happy to, to say that bystanders are incidental. I think bystanders are, are collaborators in, in acts of violence, in as much as they do nothing. Um, but that's, that's a, quite a personal view, which I know perhaps isn't a consensual view. Well, presumably they shouldn't get into trouble. 
Presumably they should, they, they, they should be protected. That, that, that's what I would worry about. Um, and that's why I think this idea may, it, it, it may be a good idea, it may be a double-edged sword. On the other, look, also, just, just, just to step back a little bit, we, we're talking as if everything has broken down catastrophically, and, and, and it hasn't. There are, there are systemic breakdowns, but there's a lot of ordinary stuff that's working. There's a lot of ordinary investigative stuff that is being effectively carried out. There's a lot of very good student support services that are, that, that are really being maintained by people just absolutely committed to them. Um, there's a lot of decent people um, in, in all around the university, every level of student representation, every level of employment within the university and amongst the student body. And we should perhaps, in focusing on problem areas, not do what I warned about at the beginning of the talk, not get apocalyptic about this and say, oh my God, this is a whole place has gone to hell. Um, that, that what we're doing is foregrounding problems, um, uh, but we also need to just keep in the back of our mind, there's a whole lot of stuff that's, that's re there's a whole lot of really good stuff going on. Yeah, um, now you said um, like the, the absence of an institution, you know, to deal with these problems is like creating the recurrence of this violence on campus. And I think as it is, it has been ongoing. It has been going for a long time and it's still ongoing. So I'd like to know if there's like anything in the pipeline at the moment to create an institution that will deal with these issues because I think it's very pressing now. Yeah, there they, they are things in the pipeline and they, and they go in waves. I mean, the safety review that happened um, this uh, project that, I work, that I've worked on a bit um, that seemed to be at work and then falter um, called the Safe Campus Project. Um, the Department of Higher Education recently sent a, a directive to the universities requiring that all universities in South Africa do, uh, address gender-based violence and sexual harassment. And the university certainly seems to be in the process of responding positively to that. Hence me being asked to give this talk. I mean, that's part of... The, of, of the university executive saying, well, well, let's look at this, let's fix it. Um, uh, so, so these things are happening. Uh, and, 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 and certainly, once again, we mustn't just think that only these, these negative examples are evidence of what's going on there. I mean, the mere fact that I stood here and gave this talk is evidence of a real desire um, by, by leadership within the university to, to, to raise the issues and to look at ways of solving them. Um, I, I'm based at DUT, the, at the International Center of Nonviolence, um, and DUT is also looking at a possible, some sort of core curriculum, though its shape is not that clear. Uh, some, uh, a real question I've got in my mind is that the pressure on me is to talk about nonviolence, mm. but sometimes I think that to, to talk about, you know, just values that we shouldn't assault each other may not be as effective as talking about our experience of violence because, I mean, as you point out, there, there's a long history of violence before this. Mm. It's not that it's changing dramatically now. The question is what kind of interventions we can make now mm. that would really have an impact and will, and will take years mm. you know, to reduce significantly the levels of violence, but we have to start somewhere. Um, there, there is in Peter Maritzburg the Alternatives to Violence Project, which I think is, you know, it's a, it's a resource. Um, I, I was, but something that struck me was that very little teaching takes place that directly addresses the violent experiences of students. Um, and then earlier this year, I was asked to teach a module in Peter Maritzburg, where it's a certificate course aimed at part-time students based in community settings. I was teaching with uh, Tulisida Mpambageli, who's based here as my co-teacher, um, and we used a gender-based approach in that we talked about the experiences of violence, but divided by gender, mm -hmm. which worked very, very well. Um, in fact, I had very, the, the anger in the group came largely from the men about the, what had been done to them. 
which was very interesting, and I think it changed the dynamics a bit of, of men always feeling blamed as mm. perpetrators and not seeing what lay behind and before that. So I think there's a... Um, the, the one thing for me that really stands out, though, is that students come to university, and that university experience should be something which is transformative, that it doesn't simply duplicate the existing values of the society, but it actually challenges the existing values of the society. And to do that, it actually has to create a safe space. If it doesn't do that, it reinforces all the most negative features of our society, all of the racism, the, you know, the stuff about class and exclusion. And I think it's, uh, it has to be challenged. Yeah, I mean, my, 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 my strong bias is towards saying that we know how to do transformative education in the social sciences and that we just really need to scale it up and look at this. And, and certainly I come from a sort of anachronistic old school where the university's first job is not to um, train people for jobs. It's to, it's to produce citizens for a better society. And, and I still believe that, even though it's obviously an increasingly ludicrous belief to hold in the current context. Um, and, but I think um, that, that we, we're fairly skilled at that, but we're not deploying those skills. And one of the things I've tried to do is, is, is to develop the kind of courses you're talking about, to develop courses on violence, to, de to develop courses on trauma and victim empowerment, um, where, we, where we, we deal with that stuff in class. And, and I mean, at the risk of it becoming a, a sort of a, a, um, a self-congratulating congratulatory conversation between two white men. Um, I think that this issue of dealing with, with, with men and their victimization is really huge because most of the violence we are, are seeing is gender related in some way. Um, but there seems to be this strange resistance to saying, yeah, well, men end up being violent because they have been systematically brutalized. And unless we're prepared to actually face up to that and start doing something about that, we're really going to be doing this kind of trivial moral exhortation of we must be good citizens. Um, and we're not, really going to, we're not really going to dismantle the conditions that produce um, violence in, in people. Um, I think it's commendable that the university is actually taking an initiative at the higher level but I think in order for the problem to actually be grasped and, and maybe try solve it, it has to go back to the grassroots. You mentioned in your solutions the training for student volunteers and representatives, as well as the core academic training for all students. I think if that was successful, it would go some way in maybe changing the way students think or, or, or treat each other and could maybe stem the tide. I think I'd, I'd, I didn't... I would appreciate it personally if, if maybe you could elaborate more as a student what exactly you mean by the training for students and that academic training for students, maybe briefly. Um, okay, we, we're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to, I, I, I think that might be our last question. Um, look, it, 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 it means firstly giving people an opportunity to think about themselves, which surprisingly is not something we do socially. We don't allow people to stand back and say, listen, well, who am I? What beliefs do I hold? What do I believe about myself, about groups of people, about people who are the same as me, about people who are different from me? What do I believe I should do if someone is um, offending me? All those kinds of questions, to, to create space for that sort of reflection. Um, and a lot of the effective work that we do, and this, some of this may come out of my bias in psychology, is to, to get people to work, um, sort of do, do sort of memory work, where they, where they say, look, well, how, why do, how have I come to believe that? Like, who, who told me? Where did I learn that, that this is okay? Um, given that now that I step back and think about it, it's clearly dysfunctional. Um, for instance, you know, when we talk about gender-based violence, one of the biggest problems of gender-based violence is not men being violent to women, it's men killing each other. This is a major pattern of homicide in South Africa. Uh, men getting into arguments and then killing each other. That's actually one of the biggest forms of violence. 
Um, well, that's certainly the biggest form of homicide, but if there's a consistent pattern of violence around there. But people have never had an opportunity to say, wait a minute, I know that situation. I know when someone's dissing me and I'm becoming enraged. But they've never had an opportunity to, to, to reflect on that, both intellectually and say, okay, so what goes on then? But also to say, well, how did I come to experience that situation in that way? So we need to talk about these things. The other thing we need to... We need, we need um, a group, groups that are silenced to be allowed to speak. Women who are not allowed to speak about their sexual victimization because it's a taboo topic. Gay people who are not allowed to talk about um, being beaten up because of their sexual orientation. Creating those kinds of spaces where pe people have been silenced um, can actually just put out in public, this is my experience and the rest of you need to think about it. Um, so it's, it's about dialogue. It's about self-reflection, and it's about coming to understand how you came to be who you are now. And, and, and th these, these things are actually not hard to do. Um, uh, there, there are many programs nationally and internationally that are, that are working along these lines. And all we need to think about is how to roll them out and how to make them something that everyone has access to. And ultimately, I don't even think this should be a university project. I mean, I think that this should be a school curriculum. I mean, certainly speaking for myself, after my first three years of school, learning to read and write, they didn't teach me anything worthwhile after that. Um, and they could have used the remaining 10 years to teach me really important skills about how to live with people, which I only really started thinking about later. Anthony, can I? Yes, Rosina. Um, I'm not sure, is this on? Is it on? Hi. Um, I think, I mean, I, I'm, I know Anthony just said, that, you know, there isn't a lot of time. So I, I hear you asking a question that I, I think we probably need more time to answer. I'm new to the university. Um, I'm the new head of gender studies. And I was in the same meeting that Anthony attended. Um, I know that Anthony and several people, perhaps people in the front there, um, have been involved in a committee and a working group addressing gender-based violence on the campus. So as a new person, I've been here not even a month, but the meeting that I attended, um, there were lots of kinds of suggestions put forward. Um, and as somebody who, I mean, I'm an academic, I also do violence against women work, and it's also part of my kind of um, academic work. But one of the things that was addressed in the meeting is the possibility to look across board to look at, for example, in student organizations, um, when people run for the SRC, um, also the RAs, the kind of training that they get um, at, the, at the residence level, the kind of training that happens in RMS. At a more recent meeting yesterday, there was the RMS person was there, the security. Um, and also to, to kind of look at the, the training that happens how that training can be broadened, what we can do from the level of student representative councils, what we can do at the level of when students apply and have something in the handbook that actually talks about it, um, and then also in terms of counseling services, in terms of courses. So basically, um, at every possible level where we can talk about responsibility, where we can also look at ways that people learn how to address a situation for ex in, in the residence, but also um, see it as not only the responsibility of a campus group of interested and concerned people, or not the responsibility of gender studies per se, but it becomes everybody's responsibility to kind of examine the ways that we interact interact with each other, and if the training that needs to happen then happens at the level of the SRC as well as other, as other places, then that's what we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, I think to, you know, to, to, just to close up, what we, I'm hoping this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a, of a summary of, a, of, of what I think. Um, and the, the two things that you can do if you want to take this further. Firstly, if, you, if you're a student, there's the student group, SERA, Students Against Rape and Hate. And you can kind of sign up with them and, 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 and get that kind of stuff going. There's also another um, group, the Gender-Based Violence Working Group, which is just a collection of people who worry about that and, and, and try and address that. And um, plus, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of university working group called the Safe Campus Project. And if any of you are particularly keen on, on really committing to working on these issues, I mean, then that, 
that, that does require serious commitment. To, 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 to talk to us about, um, about joining that group too. Okay, is there anything, any very quick last thing before we, before we wrap up? Okay, I think that's, that's about enough as we need for a cold evening like tonight. Colleagues and, and students, I think we've had an interesting evening of, uh, of a lecture which is not far away from us. And I need to flag you know, a couple of issues which, which have been raised. The first one is that you know, safety and security you know, on campus cannot be taken for granted. And these are you know, collective responsibilities that we must all have. Uh, and, and I think that's very important. Uh, and, you know, talking about safety and, you know, security, before I came here, I had I Googled and see what has been happening in other African universities. The story is quite, you know, the same. I mean, we've got uh, students who have been mugged. We've got uh, sexual harassment. So... It's not the question of this UKZN being different, but I think that in almost all Afghan universities, the story is more or less you know, the same. So we need to take safety and you know, security as, as a collective responsibility. The second issue which I would will, will like to flag is that individual and institutional response has been low or has been inadequate or has been poor, right, as you can. And I think these are you know, some of the systemic you know, failures and issues that we need to bring across. Uh, why is it that uh, bystanders will not want to uh, actually report or you know, intervene? Is it a question of, one, that they are afraid of their lives, or two, that they may be part of the crime, or maybe just that they are afraid of the police because the, the moment you become a witness, of course, most Africans will not want to go to the police you know, station. This is the question of being afraid of you know, the police. So that's why you know, people will not want to go and report because if you report, you become a witness. So again, we need to deal with this. The, the other issue which i like to bring across or which also you know, came across, uh, you know, forcefully in the, in the lecture is we need to begin to talk about these things openly. And I think the issue of training has been flagged. It seems to me that we may have to develop our, or maybe revise, you know, our programs, you know, some of our programs to take account of, you know, some of these emerging problems and issues. And on this note, I'd like to thank Mr. Anthony Collins for making himself available for the lecture. And as I said, this is just the beginning of our talk on issues around safety and you know, security. As I said already, this is the first lecture you know, in the humanities. We have a second lecture in in July, specifically 27th July, and that talk will be given by Professor Vail. And the lecture is, let's call the talk, Rediscovering the Humanities in South Africa. Thanks a lot you know, for coming. I understand there is refreshment. Have a good evening. <laughs>